So it's my joy to welcome my darling wife, Nelly. I'm also here to, here to listen to her preach. I really enjoy listening to her. And, and I've heard her many times and I never get tired. Uh, so it's my joy to welcome you and pray for you. Hosanna. By the way, we just celebrated 39 years of marriage. And, uh, and it's, it's a really good number. In fact, Pastor George, as you said, that Jesus was last 39 times. I said to myself, that's... <laughs> I said to myself, that is not our case. You know, we have had a joyful marriage, 39 years. Uh, I think, you know, we have three children, three grandchildren. And, uh, and so it's really a joy to live with this darling woman. And, uh, and she with me, we tell each other that, by the way. And so every day you have to tell your spouse something about how much she means to you or he means to you. And that's how we build our marriages. We keep the enemy out and we stand strong together. Uh, so anyway, I've said on that. Let me now pray. Our gracious Father, how wonderful you are. What a joy to know that every day you give us your turnarounds. That Lord, we just have to be patient. We have to listen to you, walk with you. And Lord, because in that turnaround, you're also molding us. You're also shaping us. You're also building up our faith. I think, Lord, of the story of Joseph shared here. Our Lord, you were molding him, preparing him for something greater. And Lord, if he had given up in Potiphar's prison, oh God, what would have happened? But thank you, Lord, that you call us to be patient. You call us to wait on you. So thank you for that. Thank you for the message that Pastor Billy will bring to us. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to her. Thank you for the living word that is in her because your Holy Spirit is in her. Thank you, Lord, for the preparation she has done. It is so important to wait upon the Lord. For those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And thank you, Father, that when we preach, the most important person we're preaching to is ourselves. Because, Lord, we know you speak to us, and I know you've spoken to Pastor Nelly. So now use her great. Speak through her, O oh God. Bless her as she ministers, and bless us as well, in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. I thank the Lord for today. We thank the Lord for Jesus Christ. We thank the Lord for his resurrection. And so today, even as we are um, about the courts of heaven, it's a topic that did not originate with me. Many of you have listened to other people talk about courts of heaven. And I also listened to many other people talking about the courts of heaven, but I was confused. There were so many things that by the end of the teaching of the courts of heaven, I was more confused than I was at the beginning. And I was going to turn away from it when the Lord told me, mm -mm, I want you to study it and simplify it for the body of Christ. Uh, study it and simplify it for the body of Christ. And so... To understand the courts of heaven, we need to understand that Jesus Christ is our high priest. He, he's our high priest on earth. He was a high priest on earth, came as a high priest. And then we are going to understand today that he went back to heaven also as a high priest. And we are going to understand today what it is he is doing in heaven as our eternal and everlasting high priest. Okay? Jesus Christ is the high priest on earth. And we are going to see how that is. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11 to 12, it talks about the blood of Christ. And I'm going to read it for us. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is made, uh, is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not a part of this creation. So there is a tabernacle in heaven. And we all know the tabernacle that Moses also had here on earth. So when we talk about the courts of heaven, we are going to see how Jesus Christ ministers in the tabernacle in heaven. Verse 12 tells us, 
he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his blood. And what was the result? Thus obtaining eternal redemption. And this was only possible by him rising from the dead. The most powerful event that ever happened in the history of mankind was the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't the death. It was the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 17 to 19, this is the New International Version, it says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. Even if he died, even if he was crucified, but he never rose from the dead, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And also, those relatives of, of ours who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. I want us to understand the power of the resurrection. It goes on to say, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. And so today, we celebrate the resurrection. We celebrate the resurrection. The Romans crucified people before Jesus. Jesus was not the first person to be crucified. And even after Jesus was crucified, they continued to crucify people here on earth. Crucifixion was, was the most horrible death that anyone could submit a human being to. And that is what God chose for Jesus Christ. But Jesus' resurrection set him apart from all the people who had succumbed to death through crucifixion over the years even before he came. So what we celebrate today is resurrection. It is resurrection. Hallelujah. Amen. So why did Jesus have to die? In Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 14 to 15, I will read that for us. Why did Jesus have to die? So that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. In our ministry, we, did a, we do a lot of counseling and praying for people. And it is amazing how many people tell me that they fear death. And we can see here that it is a slavery. Can you imagine living with the fear that one day I'm going to die? And that's all you're thinking of. One day I'm going to die. So Jesus has by his death taken away. He has freed us from the fear of death. Why? Pastor George mentioned a verse earlier on concerning the sting of death. That is what Christ has removed from death. So now we are being told, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? And bear with me because I'm going somewhere with this and we are going to end up in the courtroom this morning. Okay? Since Jesus came as a high priest, he had to accomplish his priestly duty. And the priests, their priestly duty was to offer sacrifices for the people. But they were using uh, the blood of, of goats and sheep and bulls. But Jesus had to accomplish his priestly duty and bring his blood into the Holy of Holies. He had to bring his blood into that tabernacle that is in heaven. And he had to actually go and pour his blood on that altar. That altar which is in the tabernacle which is, is in heaven. And he had to do that to atone for the sins of the people. When did Jesus carry his blood into the heavenly altar in the tabernacle? And many times I thought it was figurative. It is just something that happened while he's here on earth. But that is not the case. He took his blood into the heavenly altar in the tabernacle between when he met the women and when he met the disciples, which was today. Which means 
early in the morning on the first day, which was a Sunday, while it was still dark, we are told Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Why did the angels remove the stone from the entrance? Was it to let Jesus out? No. Jesus did not have to come out through that, that door to the tomb. That stone was rolled away so that you and I can know that he's no longer in the tomb. Amen? Amen. So, Jesus meets Mary Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene, thinking he's a gardener originally, asked him where they'd taken the body of Jesus. And then when Jesus calls Mary by her name, there's a way that God calls you. And he calls me. That you know that is God calling me. It is special. There's a way that maybe Mary, I don't know. But ah, it's a master. That's how he calls me. And so she ran to him. And there are passages that tell us, she said, called him Rabbi. And she was going to go and hold him. But what did he say? Do not hold on to me. Why? For I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father. To my God and your God. Why was he ascending? This was the first ascension. The second one was when the cloud took him up. But this is the first ascension. When Jesus goes to the tabernacle, carrying his own blood for you and I. And he, he went behind the curtain. That curtain that already had been torn from top to bottom. And that is where he offered his blood. And he stayed the whole day in, in heaven. That particular day. Because remember, it was early in the morning. But when he appears to his disciples, it's in the evening of the first week. Do you see? So he went. Spent that whole day with the father. And then he came back in the evening. And when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Jesus Christ had already finished his work, isn't it? By the time he had gone to the tabernacle. So why did he come back to the earth? Why did he come back that same evening? Okay. So this journey back to heaven, first of all, the ascension with his blood was the most important journey Jesus ever made. Because that is what clinched everything that he came to the earth to do. That is when he said, it is finished. It is finished. Finally. And what did that do? It concluded his priestly assignment on earth. Remember we said that he had an assignment on earth as a high priest. But now... He has an assignment in heaven also as a high priest. Okay? So after his heavenly assignment, he comes back to earth. To do what? To give final instructions to his disciples and to say his goodbyes. The Bible tells us that he appeared to 500 people at the same time. Because he didn't have much time. Appeared to 500 people at the same time. He appeared to Peter alone. Then he appeared to the disciples. Okay? And so let me read Acts chapter 1 verse 2 and 3. And it says, until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. Some of them are still thinking they were dreaming. But he had to stay here long enough for them to believe he truly rose. How long did he have to stay? 40 days. For 40 days, he came and he stayed on this earth, convincing them with proofs that indeed I am alive. And this is also the time when he tells them later on about how the Holy Spirit will come. Because if he had stayed in heaven, he would not have told them about the coming of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? But... He, he does tell them about the coming of the Holy Spirit. So he appeared to them over a period of 40 days. And then what else did he do? He spoke to them about the kingdom of God. He came back to instruct them and to tell them about the kingdom of God. Now, in Acts 1.8 is when we are told 
that he, told, he tells them about the Holy Spirit. He said, I told them you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Then verse 9, after he has told, the last thing that he told them about was the Holy Spirit. Okay? For us to understand how important the Holy Spirit is. He tells them about the Holy Spirit, verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Hebrews 4, 14 and 16 says, Now, this is Daniel that is speaking to us, the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament. And this is a scene that God showed Daniel. And God showed Daniel the courtroom. So let us read it together. This is Daniel speaking. As I looked, thrones were set in place. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and his wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. These are angels, because in other places, when we are told about thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000, he's talking about the angels. Okay? He says that they stood before him. What happened after that? The court was seated and the books were opened. So this is what God is showing Daniel. God in a courtroom. So we are used to seeing God as our father. And we see him, you know, just our father we can come to daddy, which is okay. God is also a righteous judge. And this is where we see him. He's called the Ancient of Days. He comes in into the courtroom. The court is seated and it starts just like the high court in Kenya. The judge will come in and then people will sit down and the files will be brought, isn't it? Okay? So, listen to Isaiah chapter 3 verse 13. It says, the Lord takes his place where? Mm -hmm. The Lord takes his place in court. He rises to judge the people. And we are going to understand the difference between the judgment in the courtroom and the judgment at the end of time. The judgment in the courtroom is to do with deeds. Okay? But the judgment at the end of time is to do with salvation, which means accepting Christ. All right? Now, the Bible gives us an example of what happens in the courtroom. What used to happen. This is in Zechariah. And remember that Zechariah is in the Old Testament. Old Testament was a time of the law, but the New Testament is a time of grace. So we are going to look at this passage, Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. This is now God opening the eye of Zechariah the same way he had opened the eye of Daniel. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, this is, remember, this is the high priest. Okay? All right. We have pastors here. So he showed me the pastor standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. Satan is accusing him. 
in the courtroom in heaven. Then the Lord says, this is now Jehovah God, the Lord says uh, to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. And many people think that because it says the Lord rebuke you, Satan, that means today we cannot rebuke Satan, you know, directly. We, we only tell Satan, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. No, that has changed. Because you're going to see what Jesus Christ has done for us to be able to rebuke Satan directly. Okay? But this is a time when Jesus Christ has not yet come to the earth. And so, there is no power over Satan except by the Lord himself. Okay? Then he says, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a, a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now remember, this is the, is the high priest. And yet, we are told Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. So Satan does not accuse us for nothing. He does not accuse us for nothing. He will not come to say you've got dirty clothes and yet your clothes are clean. No. When, he, when Satan accused him, it is because Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes. So we need to understand that indeed the courtroom is about the clothes. And the clothes are the deeds of the saints. You see that in the book of Revelation. So the angel says to those who are standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. The angel does not argue and say, no, he's a high priest. He cannot be sinful. His clothes are not dirty. No, his clothes were dirty. When Satan accused him. And then after that, if you go on to read verse 11, it tells you that they removed his filthy clothes, put the clean garments on him. And this is symbolic of how God will deal with his children in the courts of heaven after he sends Jesus to the earth. And in this passage, Jesus is called the branch. And what does Jesus do? If Jesus was there, he would have been, have been the one to put on, or put on us the robe of righteousness when we are accused, when we are accused by Satan. Judgment always follows the breaking of the law. Judgment must follow the breaking of the law. God cannot turn his back on the breaking of the law. It has to be dealt with. And we are going to see today how it is dealt with in the courtroom. We are back to Daniel. Remember Daniel had shown us the, the courtroom with the ancient of days? Then Verse 13, Daniel says something else happened in the courtroom. He says, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. Remember, you've just seen the cloud picking him up in Acts 1.9. Now you know where the cloud took him. The cloud took him to the courtroom. Right? And you're going to see why. When Jesus left the earth, he had to go straight to the courtroom. All right? We are told he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. We have not been told that this is Jesus. But can you guess who this is? Who has been given authority, glory, and sovereign power? The one who's been called one like the Son of Man. It is Jesus Christ. So, God was showing Daniel in the Old Testament what was going to happen later on. How Jesus was going to come and change everything in the country. Okay? So, <clears throat> we are told all peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Aren't you and I happy and glad that when he left this earth, he went to the courtroom? You're going to be very, very grateful to Jesus today when we understand the courtroom. And before I continue, let me tell you why I'm even talking about the courtroom, why today we are telling you about the courtroom. It is because there are many Christians who have given their lives to Christ we know that uh, the Bible has given us all these wonderful promises. We have been told 
we need to break our generational curses and God knows we have we have done that and we expected that things would be different after that but we found out that even after breaking the generational curses there are still some areas in our lives where we still don't have victory so what do we do BBI has done its part breaking barriers have done their part I can't keep going back to breaking barriers and indeed you can't today you're going to know what is the next step after you have broken your generational curses? David, in the book of, of Psalms, talks about bringing his sins, his transgressions, and his iniquities before God. Sins are when we break the law. Any breaking of the law is sin. Transgressions are when we, out of rebellion, do what we know we shouldn't do. That's a transgression. But iniquities are when we are suffering for the sins of our forefathers. We go back to sin because now this touches on the courtroom. There are people who will sin and you do not know that you have sinned, isn't it? We have done something wrong and we are not aware that you have done something wrong. Okay? We are still guilty. God told Moses that when the Israelites sin unintentionally they are guilty and they shall bring a sacrifice that is where satan catches us because he knows that we will repent for the sins that we are aware of but we will not repent for the sins that we are not aware of okay are we together so far i can move on okay why does jesus go into the courtroom first of all remember he went as a high priest. In 1 John 2, 1, it says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. So God's desire is that we do not sin. Okay? He says, but if anybody does sin, and we all sin, so God had to make a provision for the sins that will be committed after we are born again. So he says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Where do we find the advocates? Where do we find them? The courtroom. And that is why Jesus had to go to the courtroom. He can only be an advocate if he's in the courtroom. And we are being told here that we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. A, 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 a version that says but so that if we sin there is someone who speaks to the father on our behalf if someone who speaks to the father on our behalf so the bible presents God as a righteous judge God uh, the bible presents God as a righteous judge he is called God the judge of all. God, the judge of all. Okay? So, God's throne as a righteous judge is a courtroom with God sitting on his throne to judge. Okay? Listen to what Psalm chapter 7 verse 6 to 8 says. Awake my God. This is David. Awake my God. Decree justice. Let the assembled peoples gather around you. Rule over them from on high. Let the Lord judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my in, uh, integrity, O Most High. Remember that in the courtroom in heaven, the people were being judged there. The books were there. But here we, say, we are being told, rule over them from on high. Where you are, which means rule over the people on the earth people on the earth okay what is satan's aim we see this in revelation 12 and verse 10 which says for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our god day and night has been hurled down in zechariah we saw him accusing the high priest okay and indeed the high priest's clothes were dirty. But 
if the high priest had known that his clothes were dirty, he had, would have done something about it. This is where we talk about the unintentional sins. Where our clothes are dirty, and we don't know our clothes are dirty. The only time we know they are dirty is when Satan accuses us. Do you see? When he accuses us. God's holiness and justice requires that sin God has to show justice to Satan when Satan is correct in accusing you and accusing me. God has to give him justice. Otherwise, he ceases to be a holy God. So, God's holiness and justice requires that sin is judged. Okay? And he accuses us in the courtroom. I looked up accuser. Because we are being told Satan is the accuser. And what does the dictionary say about accuser? He says, accuser is one who brings a charge against a person in a court of law. So when Satan is called the accuser, we can see that he brings charges against us in the heavenly courtroom. I don't think he takes it to the high court, the one that is near. Yeah? Hebrews 4.16 we have a standing invitation from God. Satan accuses us in the heavenly courtroom saying that we cannot receive from God because our file is full of sins, transgressions, and iniquities. And I've already told you the difference between the sins, the transgressions, and the iniquities. But Hebrews 4, 16 tells us to come into his throne room with confidence. And he says that is where we find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. So there is a standing invitation for us. We should never fear the courtroom. He says once um, we are declared guilty in the courtroom, and I will tell you how you'll be declared guilty in the courtroom. Once we are declared guilty in the courtroom, Satan has a legal right. It's a legal issue. He has a legal right to send his evil spirits to engage us in battle, sadly, and win. So the areas where we are finding ourselves that Satan is defeating us is an area where Satan has, has won in the courtroom. Why did he win in the courtroom? Why did he win in the courtroom? I will tell us that. So why do we often lose in the battlefield? Satan has a legal right to, to punish us. And he has a court order to demolish our purpose. So I am praying about this thing. I'm praying about this business of mine. And, and, and indeed, it's God who lay, who lay it in my heart. You see. And every time I try to move ahead, bam, there's something in front of me. Every time I try to move ahead, bam, there's something in front of me. That is because I've got a case in the courtroom. Now, many of us do not even know that there's a courtroom. Isn't it? If we are honest, how many of us did not know there's a courtroom? It's okay, you don't have to put up your hands. I don't want to embarrass anyone here. But there, for a long time, I didn't know there was a courtroom. And so there are certain areas in my life where I have done everything that I know how to do. And yet, I'm not moving ahead. I did not know that I had a case in the courtroom. The reason why I didn't know was because what it is that I did that gave Satan a legal ground was something I was not even aware of. I did not know that it was a, it was a sin. Satan is a legalist and he knows the word of God. The moment I break the law to the courtroom, he's accusing me the way he was accusing uh, uh, Joshua. Okay? That is Satan the accuser. You can't, you, can't, you can't bless him with that job because he did this and that and that and that and he has not, his clothes are dirty. He's before the courtroom, but his clothes are dirty. If your clothes are dirty, they have to be dealt with, isn't it? Because Joshua, his clothes, when they were dirty, they had to deal with it. They had to um, take them away and bring new clothes. Now, as believers, and we may, as we go through the day, there are so many things that we do that we offend people without even knowing that we're offending them, isn't it? And when that happens, I am guilty. I did not know I offended the person, but I am guilty. 
and we like to use that excuse. But I did not know that I offended you, isn't it? So I feel like I am not guilty because I did not know that I offended you. But the Bible is telling me I am guilty. And Satan will run to the courtroom with that very same thing that I have done. And then Ecclesiastes 12 to 14 tells us, For God will bring every deed into judgment. How I treated that beggar in the streets. I thought it was just, ah, I was in a bad mood that day. And so, ah, and, and he, he was, they, were, they were bugging me and following me up and down the streets. So I tell them, ah, I'm Jinga Wewe. And I said, I shouldn't have said that. Satan is going to run with it. Okay? So for me, I said it and moved on. But now I'm wondering why something is blocking me. And I do not know what it is. I am praying. I'm, I'm, I don't even know what to, uh, to apologize for because I've already forgotten even what I did in the streets. Those are the kind of sins that Satan piles up against me in the courtroom. Because God says, I will bring every deed. Was what I did to the beggar a deed? Was it a deed? Yes, it was. He says he'll bring every deed into judgment. He has to, to maintain his holiness and to maintain his justice. He says, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Praise the Lord. It's not only the evil things that God brings into judgment. Even that good deed that I did. I even forgotten about it. But now all of a sudden I'm finding favor. I don't realize that that favor is now a good deed that God is bringing into judgment. In the same way that the lack of favor is a bad deed that God is bringing into judgment. Okay? When things are not working in our lives, and we have done everything we know how to do, and people come to me and tell me, now what, what next? What next? Because you already prayed for me, and I, I, we broke our, my generational curses, A, B, C, D, things got even worse. Because now, Satan is not dealing with the iniquities. Those ones take iniquity. He's not dealing with the transgressions. Because you are not going to just obviously sin knowing it is sin. So transgressions, easily we confess them. Take. But the sins are divided into two. The known and the unknown. Okay? Let us reason together. You're saying you're innocent. Because these are the times when I can't think of anything wrong that I have done. That I say that I am innocent. Isn't it? So, God is saying, okay, come. Let us reason together. Reason? Reason with God? He's saying, yes. Come and reason with me. I'm willing to come and, you, and hear you. Alright? Uh, Isaiah 43, 26. I love this one. God says, okay, let us, let us go back and let us, one by one, let us see all the things that you're telling me that you have cleared. It's no longer part of your of your, of, of your book. Because remember, in the courtroom we saw a book. Books were open. Where have those uh, accusations been written? In your book. And that's a book that Satan has run with to the courtroom. So if you open your book, you're going to find things that you didn't know that you were wrong, but that you did. So in the courtroom, I am guilty. Alright? So he says, review the past for me. Let us argue the matter together. Can you imagine God telling you that? Let us argue the matter together. Me and argue with you, God. Far be it from me. Isn't it? But he's saying, no. I'm bigger than that. Review the past for me. Let us argue the matter together. State the case of your innocence. So I start saying, um, you see, me, I, 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 I wake up at 3 a.m. every day and I pray. And even those books, the, 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 the prayer guides that I use, they cover every area. You know. They start with the mind and they cover it. And then they start with the emotions, they cover it. Then, you know, then when that doesn't work, then I went to a, a different one who now was more enlightened than the one who wrote the first book. Isn't it? So I say, state the case of your innocence. Now, although God is telling us all this, you know very well that him as a righteous judge, I cannot go and argue with him. Although he's telling me, yeah, come and argue with me. But we all know 
that it is a lawyer who represents you in court. It is the advocate who represents you in court. And we have already been told that we have an advocate. It is Jesus Christ. And he has gone up as a high priest and an advocate for us. Okay? It is no different with... What a humble God. No wonder when he tells us to be humble, he's humble first. That he would allow us who are... First of all, the earth is a dot in the universe. And you are a dot on the earth. And he's telling you, come and present your case. Come and argue with me. He's even allowing Jesus Christ to come and speak to him on your behalf. Because Jesus Christ has said, when you sin, we have an advocate. Not when you are doing well, you have an advocate. No. When you sin. How blessed are we? How blessed are we? With this Jesus who has gone into the heavens for us. We are blessed. We are blessed. So, when things go wrong in our lives, the fault is not with God. Okay? Because Jesus is in the courtroom. He's there. You saw where, the, where the, the cloud took him. To the courtroom as an advocate. And he's there to plead our case before the Father. On the basis of the blood he shed for our sins. So we look at these three verses. The first one is Hebrews 7.27. Which says he sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Alright? Then the second verse is Hebrews 7.22. Which says, in fact... The law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There is no way I can tell God to forgive me without mentioning the blood of Jesus. No way. God cannot forgive you of anything other than that you come through the blood of Jesus. Because you have to be cleansed through the blood. And that is why I have to go through Jesus. As my advocate. And we are told. Which we have seen before. He entered heaven itself now. This is not now the Daniel. We have seen that. This is now the present. How the courtroom is working. Presently. Okay. He says he entered heaven itself now. To appear for us in God's presence. So you ask yourself. He already came to the earth. And he died for our sins. It was once and for all. So why is he now still going back to heaven to appear to God in, a, in, in you know, for us in God's presence? Okay? Because without a cause, a curse will not pass. We say, remember God has told us, come and you can argue with me and everything. But what God is telling me, at the end of everything, I have argued out my case. Without a cause... A curse will not come to pass. If there is something blocking my life, there is a reason. And that reason is that I am guilty. It's never on God's side. I am the one that is guilty. I am the one who needs to deal with the accusations in my book in the courtroom. And we are going to find out today how to do it. This, we are ending this, this service very well. When I walk out feeling empowered, that now I know how to deal with the things that have been standing in my way. Proverbs 26, verse 2 says, Like a flattering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. It is painful to hear that what has happened to me, I deserve it. What? He's saying, I deserve it. And yet God has, has a way out for me. And so he says we perish for lack of knowledge. Because we don't even know that there's a courtroom. I don't even know that there are accusations in my book. There's a verse in the Bible that tells us, agree with your accuser quickly. Your accuser, who's a devil, does not accuse you when you've not done anything. He's, he's smart enough to, to, to not bring a case before God and embarrass himself. And it's something you didn't do. Okay? Why do we need an advocate? See this in 1 John 1, 8 to 10. I'm going to read it here. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves 
and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, why have I highlighted it? Because it is conditional. If I confess it, what about if I don't confess it? And many times I don't confess it because I don't even know it exists. I don't even know that, that I sinned. Okay? But we're saying if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Once he purifies me from all unrighteousness, I am no longer guilty in the courtroom. There is no unrighteousness on me. Satan has got no legal ground. And everything that God has in store for me is going to get to me. Okay? We are told he's faithful and just and he forgives us. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So Jesus has to go to the courtroom as an advocate because he knows we will continue to sin as we live on this earth. So not only did he deal with our eternal sin, which is that we are not going to hell because of the Adamic sin that came upon us and Jesus dealt with that on the cross of Calvary, he has also made provision for the sins that we commit after we have been delivered and saved. So we are totally covered. We are totally covered. So there are sins we commit without knowing that we have sinned. So we do not confess them. We are going to see how to deal with them. These are the sins that Satan accuses us of, of in the courtroom. Alright? 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Why did he still need to be a mediator? He had already died for our sins. It's just what I've been talking about. He's now covering us so that the blessings of God can come to us, the healing of God can come to us, the favor of God can come to us, because these are the things that are blocked. Sometimes it is just, Satan will block the healing. And he says, no, but look at the book. Look at their book. Okay? He can block the favor. He can block the prosperity. He says, but there is a book. There is a book. We cannot ignore that book. How do I know that I need to go to the courtroom? We're going to be talking about that too. We need to understand that there is favor in the courtroom. The courtroom in heaven always works in your favor. The minute you walk in, you have already won. Our problem is that we never walked in. Do you see? My, our problem is that we don't know we need to go to the courtroom, so we don't go. But the moment I enter that courtroom, favor is on my side. Why? The righteous judge is my father. There is nepotism in the courtroom. Isn't it? The advocate is a judge's son, and the judge's son is my savior, and we are joint heirs of God's estate. So Satan has no, no, way, no way he can win. There is pure nepotism in there. Tight. Hmm? Deep state. Yeah? He cannot. I always win in the courtroom. But I cannot win if I do not go to court. So that area where you, why is it that any time I try to do this, I fail? Because it's a case in the courtroom. But do I, do I need to know what is in my book in order for me to confess? No. What do I need to do? This is now the um, courtroom protocol. The courtroom protocol. And it is very important to know because this is the crux of today's message. It's for, how, for you to know how to go to the courtroom, isn't it? This is a courtroom procedure and protocol, right? It is exactly the same procedure that is at the high court in Kenya. Number one, when you walk in, wow, isn't it you honor the judge? You go to sit down. So the first thing that I do is that I honor the righteous judge. Okay? How do I honor the righteous judge? I just worship him. I acknowledge that he is the king of heaven. I acknowledge that his throne is truly founded on justice and righteousness. I acknowledge that he sits above the circle of the earth and he rules. Just, just acknowledge him. Why do I acknowledge Jesus? Jesus needs the highest acknowledgement. 
he is the only reason I'm going to win that I, I win that court case. His presence there is what has cost, will cause me to, to win my case. Why? Because there is no sin on this earth that his blood cannot wash. In Isaiah 1.18, what does it tell us? Though your sins are like scarlet, although they are like crimson, they will be white as wool, they will be white as snow. I can murder a hundred people. Okay? But the blood of Jesus can wash that sin from me. The blood of Jesus. There is nothing that the blood of Jesus cannot wash. So I honor Jesus and thank him. Now, in the courtroom, when Jesus, in the courtroom, the Holy Spirit is not there. And I will tell you why. He was there when Jesus was coming with a cloud. But Jesus told us, if I don't go, I will not send him back. Do you understand? If I don't go, I cannot send him back. So they, ex they exchanged places with Jesus. Jesus went into the courtroom and he sent, the Father sent the Holy Spirit down to us. To live in us and to be in us. Now it is the Holy Spirit who convicts of sin. Isn't it? So there are many times when the Holy Spirit will be convicting you of something. And you, you can't even put your hand on it. It's just, it's just like a, a cloud over your heart. Isn't it? It's time to go to the court. Because the Holy Spirit is convicting you, telling you all is not well. And when all is not well, he's talking about the courtroom. All is not well. Satan has a legal ground somewhere. Quickly, the way we are told, run! So, I honor the Holy Spirit, but I am the one who brings the Holy Spirit into the courtroom. Because he's in me. And he's with me. So I honor him. He's the one who has led me into the courtroom. Number two, my file is now there before the righteous judge, isn't it? I do not know what is in the file. All I know is that it is true. Because if it was not true, then Satan would not have a legal ground to block me. But the very f mere fact that he was able to block me means I'm guilty. So when I come into the courtroom, I come as a guilty person. I say I am guilty as charged. Whenever I come to the courtroom, don't go and start arguing. Some of us will have to argue in the courtroom. We carry that argument in the spirit. No. When I go to the courtroom, I am guilty as charged. That is why every time I try to you know, every, I, I can't even pay my children's school fees I can't, and yet the, the word of God has told me that you know he will give me according to his riches in glory I've memorized that verse and it's not working I'm guilty as charged Lord I realize now but I have an advocate righteous judge I have an advocate that is point number three I call upon the advocate to plead my case I don't try to plead my case before God I call upon the advocate, Lord Jesus, I am guilty. There are sins in there in my book which I don't know, but you know them. You can see what they are. So wash my book. I am guilty as judge. Cleanse me. It's true. I am guilty. He will always cleanse us. There's no time when Jesus will say, no, 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 my blood. Hmm? That one is too much. Never. Never. Isn't it? So he will cleanse my book and he will cleanse the sins that are in my book with his blood now see I, my, I'm now no longer unrighteous because now I am righteous in Christ he has clothed me with, his, with a robe of righteousness now I ask the judge for a verdict of not guilty I don't just walk away but he now he's cleansed my sins there was a verdict of guilty it has to be overturned sometimes you walk away before it's overturned the judge has to overturn. So I ask the judge for a verdict of not guilty. And of course I'll get that verdict. Because I'm not guilty. Jesus Christ has washed me in his blood. Five, I thank the judge for that verdict. Okay? After that, number six is when I make my petitions. But many of us, we come to God and go straight to number six. Straight. Oh, you know, this is not working and that is not working and that is not working. 
And Satan is very happy when I just run to number six. I don't go to number six. I start with number one. And I come down to number six. Now I can make my petitions. All my petitions will be granted. According to God's will. Okay? According to God's will. All my petitions are going to be, be uh, granted. Do I leave at that point? Say all is well. I can now leave the courtroom and go. No. No. This is why we are being told in, in, in Luke 10, 19. I've given you authority. This now is when we deal with the evil spirits. Why do we deal with the evil spirits? Because they were the ones who were given the, the, the mandate to come and block you. They are the ones who are given the mandate to come and bring sickness on you. They are the ones who are given the mandate through the court order to throw poverty on you. Okay? So now we deal with them. De de depending on what it is that I was petitioning for. Let us assume I was petitioning for, this, uh, for my child. Alright? Who is in ICU. And the church has prayed. The church has fasted. Everybody has done everything. The child is getting from bad to worse friend ran to the courtroom as fast as you can. The courtroom as fast as you can. Now after I have dealt with the courtroom, now I will can face the, the spirit of sickness. But some, many times we face the spirit of sickness, but they'll stay because they have a legal ground and they have a court order. But now I am done with a court order and I command the spirit of, of sickness to go. The spirit of pain, the spirit of whatever the sickness is pneumonia, whatever it is, I command it to go. It has to go. It has to go. Therefore, many times we think that just because I'm commanding an evil spirit to go, it will go and never come back. It will go because it's of the name of Jesus. But it will come back because there's an evil right to come back. And that is why we see sometimes they, they are go something is getting better, getting worse. Getting better, getting worse. In fact, getting seven times worse. Because they come back. And when they come back, they're coming back with a legal right to come in. But when I have dealt with the courtroom, they no longer have an eagle, an eagle, a right to come in. Have we understood the courtroom today? We have understood the courtroom. Maybe we can just stand up on our feet and just thank the Lord. Easter now has a, a different meaning. The Passover has a different meaning for us. Because we know that it, it is his rising and going up uh, uh, up to heaven today that that um 40 days from today yeah yeah that has made us able to win in the courtroom so go ahead and pray just thank the lord thank the lord for 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 easter thank that for the passover thank jesus for his blood that speaks over us we are told that the sprinkled blood speaks a better word than the blood of abel Whenever I come to confess, I always use the sprinkled blood. I say, Father, let, let me sprinkle me with the blood of Jesus. So that the blood of Jesus, the sprinkled blood, can speak a better word over my life, over my situation, over my business, over my health. Just thank you. Father, we just want to thank you. We thank you that you sent Jesus Christ as a high priest for us. And today he's our high priest who is in heaven. Oh, yes, pleading our case before the Father. Heavenly Father, would we be sensitive to the Holy Spirit? That whenever He convicts us of sin, we don't try to, to, to argue out our sin, but we go to the courtroom and we say we are guilty as charged. We want to thank you, Lord, that uh, you have drawn a bloodline around us. You made provision on the cross of Calvary for us not to go to hell, but now you've also made provision for us to live an abundant life here on earth. And we thank you that that abundant life is only possible, Heavenly Father when we are in touch with the courtroom. We thank you and we bless you and we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen.